Now that we are all sufficiently lubricated, welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with slides about statistics, everyday life, theoretically, and politics, as it turns out. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm in the ring at the dojo of ideas, staying warm by throwing jabs. Bart is here in my corner. How's it going, man? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and for this episode I'll be taking the identity of Hong Kong action hit star Jimmy Wang Yu. <laughs> Are you also going to be throwing jabs then? Absolutely. In the front row, it's Dean of the show. Dean. He's hooting and hollering and getting very excited for this. How's it going there? I'm going amazing because I've just found out that at the concession stand for this event, they sell 9% Sunny Boy Pineapple <laughs> Beer. <laughs> How much is it then? I don't fucking know. People buy for this for me as a gift. And it's amazing. In, in, at the concession the, stand, the they do the same thing. <laughs> I didn't know the uh, concession stand bought you gifts. Incredible. Maybe this is Praxis. Oh, is Dean a made man? Is that what we're discovering? Yeah, well, I'm associated with the, the current champ. That's Chess true. is in the ring here throwing jabs in the dojo of ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I forgot to do my pronouns. That's okay. 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 He, yeah, him. I've yeah. done them. I remember this time. Yeah, good. In the blue corner... It's Ben Shapiro. No one goof, no one fool, a representative of the right. We will not, in fact, be talking to Ben Shapiro today, but we will be talking about him, or rather, about a creation that has come from his interesting mind. It's funny to kind of criticize him like this because it feels like punching down. <laughs> like, Literally. Yeah. I don't know, he's probably about my height. On, on like an intellectual level, it really feels like punching down, even though he clearly has more power, influence, money, blah, 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 than I do. Well, I wouldn't have thought punching down. I would have thought, like, are we just, like, reacting to what he wants us to react to? I don't know. I are we being we'll... played in 4D chess? No, no, no. Sorry, I got, I got opinions on this. I would say if we're extending the metaphor of, mo the metaphor of boxing, you're punching down because he is sitting incredibly low okay he's taken the most bullshit stance all the better to lick the boot his <laughs> his role in this exchange is to occupy a position of a clown so yeah you're gonna have to punch a clown he wants to be clown. see that, that doesn't that doesn't bother me at all because like i'm gonna be honest ben shapiro activates a deep bully gland in my brain mm. like I grew up a nerd, I have always been a nerd, but a part of me wants to put his head in the toilet. Well, that and he's like five foot three. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Short King stay winning, he is not a short king. The last time I got to punch a clown was at a 10th birthday party, so I'm excited <laughs> for this. Okay, were you a child <laughs> in this situation, or were you an adult? <laughs> No comment, uh, Bart, say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I would like my lawyer to be represented if we... <laughs> <laughs> ben Shapiro, the coked up weasel... Of the right. Anyway, he has come up with a very interesting mathematical expression for government legitimacy, and he's so proud of himself for this. It's just amazing. He credits himself with it as an original idea. You see, he didn't go and look in a book for any of this. It's something he's come up entirely on his own, and boy does it show. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at this here on the page of your notes, and I gotta tell you, uh, it does look like maths. It does look like math. There are some operations in there, as we were about to see. I see letters. I've got to be honest with you. I've always wanted to be a theorist, but have no interest in, like, research or anything like that. So <laughs> I can really, like, get with this. Look, I, I can respect not reading theory, as I do not <laughs> read theory myself. Mm. But at the same time, as we shall see, he has some interesting ideas about how mathematical relationships work, too. Well, just while you write, maybe while you write it, I'll just explain here. I'm pr pretty convinced, because... Well, when you, once you write it there, people will see. It's got letters. I see a plus sign. Several of the letters are below a line. So as far as I'm concerned, this is looking like mathematics. Mm -hmm. It has a distinctly mathematical tinge to it. Okay. You so, don't have to talk me out of it because I'm, uh -huh. oh, I'm don't presently worry. becoming fascist. <laughs> if maths could turn you fascist. Like a white hat mathematician? <laughs> Not to speak down to the uh, engineering departments of our great nation, <laughs> but I'm fa fairly sure there is some relationship between maths and fascism. Mm. <laughs> so in this particular instance, we're going to start with the letter L. Right? Ben Shapiro is... taking an L. Amazing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Giving them out, theoretically. So L here is the number, quote-unquote, that represents the quantitative legitimacy of a government or a state. Okay. Do you have any benchmarks for what, like, a good L would be? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Oh, honey, you you have thought further ahead than Ben Shapiro. Okay. okay. <laughs> L, you see, is equal to... Okay, uh, we've got an equal sign. We've got an equal sign. And we have a fraction next. 
So I'm going to write the fraction line first. Yep, that's maths. Uh-huh. On the top of the fraction, I'll put the brackets that he puts in, even though I hate them. He open brackets, then S. S is our metric of social solidarity. Ben Shapiro thinks of it as basically, you don't want to fuck over your neighbour with the state. That is what he considers social solidarity to be. Incredible restraint from him to have social solidarity and not write SS. I know. <laughs> <laughs> In his framework, we'll get a bit, to a bit, a bit more in a second, social solidarity is basically when you feel like your interests align with your neighbour. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have some more brackets, R, which is responsiveness to input. So this represents... This, is this represents, like willingness to take direction? Well, it, it means the government responds to the needs of the, or the demands of the people. Also, oh, the, the subject here is, is the government. Yeah, yeah, government, the government legitimacy. Sorry, okay. I should probably write that in. Is this like how the Chinese Communist Party offered a statement when, like, it came out that some Chinese pop star was, like, abusing his wife and put out a statement saying, we recommend that you have good morals in your marriage? Is that <laughs> responsiveness to input? No, the other um, way around. <laughs> this would be how responsive the government is to uh, people saying uh, maybe... We should have a law against beating our wives. <laughs> Fair. Then we have a multiplication, and we have A, and A is what Shapiro call, calls avoidability. Gonna need an explanation of this one. Yeah, so this is how easy is it to leave and go to somewhere with a government that more aligns with you if you need to. Oh, I so fucking it, hate these guys and they're fucking I know. moving to oh different God. places. Shit, it is the worst. Yes. If you don't like it, there's the door. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And like his example is, uh, if I don't, if I'm living in California and I don't like how California is run, I can move somewhere else. Hang on, is this the avoidability of the the state yes. at a national level, or can we have an L for any given governmental body? Uh, he thinks that this works for any given governmental body and the family. Right. Yeah. This explains Wait. so much about. So does that like, <laughs> about him? <laughs> he his family like a government. Does that mean like loose divorce rules? Is that the? He does not go further on that. Um, <laughs> What's his opinion on his children's ability to just leave the house? <laughs> Fuck knows. <laughs> so what's particularly interesting about this one is Ben Shapiro is one of those people who is deathly opposed to uh, refugees coming over the border from South America, even though I would argue. They are taking every opportunity they can to avoid the failed states that they are leaving or the, the disaster situations that they are leaving. Uh, but you see, this, this is the thing, right? If so many people are crossing the southern border, that sends the A for those nations incredibly high, <laughs> right? which means their countries are legitimate and they should stay there. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he's fine with like mm. Cubans coming over, though. Honestly, I don't know. I think it would depend on the circumstances. <laughs> well, in America, the Cubans are actually... a a, a really right wing that that's what i'm saying that yeah, um, yeah demographic because they're, they're all the people <laughs> who previously owned plantations and whatnot yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what i'm saying though but I, I bet he's not so down on that mm. uh, movement of people if there's if there's still some plantations owners in cuba who want to come over i bet ben would welcome <laughs> <laughs> so we close the brackets on this okay that's good you yep. don't want an open bracket we, we do not want an open bracket so we have plus i is there mm. I'm not even a mathematician, and I can, oh, you're closing those brackets, right? Why the fuck is it like that? <laughs> we'll get to that in just a second. I is the ability of government to advance the interests of the population. Okay, interests. Yeah, we'll talk more about this in detail in a second. And now we'll get to my uh, first notational complaint. I understand why he's put the brackets in here, because if you're somebody looking at this who hasn't done algebra in 10, 15 years or whatever, you may forget how these things are combined. But these brackets, these round ones at the ends, don't actually add anything. No. Sure. So I'm going to rub them out. <laughs> okay, no, 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 hang on. They add something if you're very used to drawing boobs on a calculator, because that's how you start <laughs> and end that operation. Yeah, but I've seen some boobs in my time. Mm -hmm. I have never seen boobs that look like the top of this. Well, I was going to say Ben Shapiro's exposure to <laughs> True. press may be more limited. What's the difference between responsiveness to input and advance the interests of the population? That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm going to be the, the, uh, the <coughs> contrarian arsehole here and say- this I can finished, by the way. I can see- Well, no, you got to do the under, under the line. Uh-huh. Responsiveness to input is probably how much the government is willing to change itself, like to respond as a, a formation- to the, the wishes of people, or perhaps, oh, I don't know. Actually, that, that's interesting. You might have an authoritarian government, right, which would have a low L, 
or perhaps a big L, depending on if we're continuing the, the L metaphor, but who advances the interest of the population like a benevolent dictatorship. So you can have something that is benevolent but not responsive. Mm. So I'm saying that this one, as, I, I insofar as the internal logic of this <laughs> thing... It makes sense to have them separate. Look, not everything he's representing is bad, right? Yeah. Or a bad idea. His method of representing and the totality of what he is representing is dog shit. But, you know, that's that's a slightly different question. I'd like to propose a, um, a mini game for hosts and listeners as we go ahead. Okay. I was just doing the spelling bee thing, which is where they give you seven letters and you see how many different <laughs> words you can make with those seven letters, right? We're and not so getting as seven we go letters, along, I'm sorry. Pardon? We're not getting seven well, I'm just saying, as we go along, if you can, the longest word we can make with the various letters he's employed here, <laughs> I will arrange a prize for the listener or host who comes up with the most impressive example. <laughs> Comment on the the video, or whatever, if you've got a good one. Apart from that, let's uh, let's keep going. So okay, so we finished the top of this fraction. Oh, oh um, I'm going to leave uh, these inner brackets here because this is. Him visually distinguishing the multiplication that happens between those two things from the addition outside of it. Don't you do multiplication before addition anyway? Yes. So you don't need that? You do not need that. In fact, you don't even need the multiplication sign because... No, because we don't tend to write it, which I don't necessarily agree with because it hides information for people who aren't familiar with the notation. Yeah, no, it's, but, it's, like, it's, fair. it's fair. You could write this as R times A plus S plus I, right? His audience are fifteen hundred geriatric Floridians, so I'm not against it actually. No, nah, he's got a he's got a younger audience than that, unfortunately. But I, I can okay, I can test this. We'll get there. Okay, I don't know where like I don't know how dark money sort of works on the right, but like that Stephen Crowder guy just turned down. It didn't think he was getting enough of like a fifteen million dollar contract or some bullshit like that. <laughs> like oh yeah, that's interesting. Really <laughs> <tragic. laughs> well, he turned down a fifty million dollar deal over four years. Yeah, which is, I mean. I'd be, you want, I'll turn to that fascist for that kind of money. I'm not making stuff. <laughs> if it's one where it's like Ben Shapiro and they're like smoking c cigars and complaining about SJWs in movies, I could probably do that. That seems pretty easy. <laughs> the thing is, but I, I'm contesting Tess's previous point that Ben Shapiro has a young audience. All younger. The fucking, <laughs> younger. They're young, not boomers. I'm saying anybody younger than a boomer in a way harder shit than Ben Shapiro was offering. <laughs> Well, he's a, he's a gateway drug. Okay, but once you've had a little bit of Ben Shapiro, you're on TikTok looking at somebody, the the Nazi guy with a nose ring. Who's claiming to be the reincarnation of Hitler. Whose claim is to be the reincarnation of Hitler. Ben Shapiro is not... Ben Shapiro's weak shit! Well, he has a much bigger audience than I do. Uh, so I guess, for you in the audience listening to this, share this to your friends and family. And pay money to us on Patreon. Anyway, let's get back to this fucking equation, because I hate Ask it. Ask them if they can come up with a longer word than you can. Exactly. I'm still going with layers so far. <laughs> oh, fuck. I was going to say that. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, but you respond to the next bit. I'm going to think of a word. <laughs> okay. So on the bottom, the first thing we have is V, which is the violation of rights, which is pretty much what it says on the, on the tin, right? It's what you feel the government is doing to you that violate your rights. Oh, and that's universally agreed upon, hey? Yeah, exactly. This is multiplied by R dash. This upsets me. This is something that economists do, and I hate it. Use a different letter, because R dash is typically what you would do with a derivative, this calculus. So uh, R dash is regulatory strictness. Oh, I see what we've got here. Yeah. So bad things on bottom. Yes. Good things on top. Yes. If you divide good things by bad things, you get the goodness ratio. Yes. The legitimacy. Again, I... It looks like maths. <laughs> it is maths. It's just not good social science. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. What if the... this podcast is called? St but sorry, you're going to say something <laughs> useful. I have to shit post here, which yeah. is that this can't be social science. These are not. These are representative of numbers. Podcast is called statistically insignificant, not socially science. <laughs> no joke. One of my biggest problems with this bullshit is that he's proposing this can be numerical. What if the input that the government is getting is that people want more regulatory strictness <gasps> no <laughs> nobody would do that that's imposing on your freedom uh, but that would mean low social solidarity because people don't have solidarity with business owners yeah exactly and lastly we have another multiplication and a dash again hate this notation and a dash is aggressiveness of enforcement 
Hang on, Ben Shapiro putting aggressiveness of enforcement on the bad side of the equation. I don't know how familiar either of you or perhaps the listener are with Ben's opinion on police brutality. Oh, well, you see, in, America, the, the but... in those contexts, the police are brutalizing bad people. Right. Okay. So that is, in fact, advancing his interest. Okay, so that would be I. For him, that would be I. Right. So, so A dash might actually be a little higher, but I would be much higher and it would work out. For him, yes. Okay. This is, it's, it's making sense. It's coming together. So do you have any worked examples? <laughs> <laughs> no. Could we work an example? Maybe we could send it to him. I don't think any of this is quantifiable in the way he's representing. Well, I'm assuming he's going to give us some guide as to quantify. Honestly, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by this because, like, to me, like, most of the writers into that Hegelian bullshit about, like, civilizations rise and fall on, like, whether their spirit is high and stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm quite impressed he's actually, uh... Yeah, this is very much like a, a an economist sort of framework, and this is the kind of notation that economists yeah. use. And this is why he's not... He hasn't got the fucking juice. <laughs> because... The people who a younger audience want to watch are straight on the social spirit, like the indomitable national, I'm sure there's a German word, which is... Yeah, yeah. So as, as we have already detected, there's a lot of ideology going on here. Some things that I wanted to talk a bit more about is that like social solidarity is literally framed by him as you don't want to offend or upset the person standing next to you. His only kind of conception of social solidarity is a negative one. It's you don't want to impose something on another person. There's no concept that you might help them or they might help you. There is no kind of positive framework for social solidarity because he just doesn't see it as a thing. It also doesn't, that's not what solidarity is. He must like, you know, like, church bake sales and bullshit like that, right? Look, I don't think he's been invited to anywhere where somebody else could give him cake. Oh, wait, yeah. Dave Rubin invited him to dinner <laughs> and he turned it down because he said, well, I don't know if you, you and your partner are going to be like, as long as you weren't like gay at the dinner. <laughs> just an incredible exchange between human beings. Actually, mm. I've just remembered that Ben Shapiro is Jewish, so maybe not. When I think of solidarity, the only solidarity in just sort of this shared desire not to be interfered with that's the most British form of solidarity. <laughs> well, no. Pretty... Like, dear God, please don't step on my lawn. No, well, no. I mean, the British solidarity is in absence as well. I want the cops to make sure that they are watching to see that nobody steps on my lawn. No, no, no. Right. Okay. You're both wrong. The British solidarity is we get together and criminalize teens around us. <laughs> our bonds, oh, yeah, yeah. our yeah. bonds are solidarity, and the teens are are like the external outgroup. No. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. it's me and Mister owns his house next door. Get together to have the police stand outside our lawn so no teens can walk up. Yes, there. yes. So hang on, I'm just I'm just coming to sort of a, an idea here, and this I think would be something that comes to anyone thinking about this. So I'm sure Ben has considered this, right? What we're kind of getting to is that there might be groups of people whose interests maybe are not the same within the same society. No, no, no. This is absolutely something that works across the whole population. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking that maybe there's a different maybe classification. <laughs> and maybe, look, call me crazy. Maybe I have some more in common with the poor woman who made my shoes than I do, say, the person who... Ben Shapiro? <laughs> <laughs> look, this idea of um, different, different classifications <laughs> of people, I'm sure he'll get to that. Mm, absolutely. The other thing is that the, the regulatory strictness, as has already been observed, Safety in your workplace is a regulatory function. Safety in your food is a regulatory function. You know, safety in the medical devices that get used is a regulatory function. And all of these are seen by Ben Shapiro as bad things that the state does to make you less free. So this is why this R, this regulatory strictness is on the bottom here. Right, of course, yeah. Because he, he laughs as a libertarian. Yeah. Right. Okay. He's a libertarian without the courage to say so, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I'd prefer a libertarian to whatever Ben Shapiro is. At least the libertarians have, like, some anti-war positions occasionally. Oh, no, I agree. He's not in the slightest, <laughs> but he likes to adopt the trappings. There's this... I don't know. His wife's the uh, same age he is. <laughs> <laughs> there is a bizarre strain in, in sort of Ben Shapiro's variety of, of right-wing agitprop, which, like... 
it retains the aesthetic of like the don't tread on me spirit while supporting every boot. <laughs> yes, filleting every boot. That happens to descend from the sky. And walking that line is the reason why he has to come up with bullshit like this. <laughs> yeah. I want to make a couple of points about the mathematical structure of this as well. All right, I'm going to drink. <laughs> <laughs> as we discussed in a recent episode, we encode an interaction between things with a multiplication. We encode things that do not interact with addition. So on the top here, we have social solidarity and advancing the interests of the population act in separate to each other, right? And in the, mod in the middle here, we have responsiveness to input and avoidability, which act together. There is an interaction here between those two, and they do not interact with the other things. Okay. Which is weird. Oh, because when he says avoidability, is he talking like the Berlin Wall and shit like that? Yeah, yeah. So literally your ability to move, except I don't know what he... Well, he probably would have thought that that was like a, a, a keeping people on the inside sort of situation, which it was. Yeah. But the underlying insecurity that behind the A, the first A, the non-dash A. Avoidability. Is like, you're not allowed to leave a communist state. Yeah, okay, right. He says, America good, because you can go take pictures of tourist locations around the world, whereas North Korea bad, because people are not allowed to leave. Okay, I get it now. Well, right. <laughs> well, also, like, this is the what no material analysis does to a motherfucker, right? Avoidability is linked to your material ability to move. Ben Shapiro could up and quit the state that he is in because he has the money the power the infrastructure access to do that yeah the people who live in various states in america where they don't want to be overwhelmingly poor people who can't leave and in ben shapiro framework because he assumes that you could leave if you want to staying is consent and that kind of framework builds into his idea of what consent looks like among the governed in a given state Right, but his his ideological preposition is always going to be that poor people are poor from their own decisions. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't need a letter here. It's the fundamental. That's just one plus one equals two. For yes, his various. But that ideology is built into what is not shown here. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's it's like jazz. It's the the ideology you don't talk about. Indeed. <laughs> You've already detected, Dean, that the good bits on the top and the bad bits on the bottom mean you get a ratio of good to bad, right? Uh-huh. That, that structure is what he is going for, right? A bigger L, ironically, means your state is more legitimate. A smaller L means that the bottom, the bad things outweigh the top. Oh, also, the bottom three are all interacting. The top four are not all interacting. You get different behavior. We'll look at the, how those relate to the rates of change in a second. Well, I mean... Just to go back to one thing, you mentioned that R and A interact, which is kind of weird. But I point out that to Ben's conservative ideology, responsiveness to input and avoidability is the same metric. It really is the if you don't like it, there's the door. Yeah. So I, like his his but the reason, why I, even within his framework, I'm not sure why you would not have an interaction with the advanced the interests of the population there. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I I do think that to the conservative quasi-libertarian mindset. If you aren't politically responsible enough to put in the input, if you aren't politically responsive enough to exercise your agency, which is assumed, mm. then you can just leave. So to him, that's the, that's the interaction here, is that if, it's, if the government isn't listening to you, you can pick up and move. But there's no... There's so many dimensions to the idea of government responsiveness yeah. that having just the one R is... <laughs> well, you don't have a second R, but it's not related. Yeah, well, one of the most frustrating parts about this is how one-dimensional of these things are. Like, yeah, I'm beginning to think this might not be good, Matt. I'm not yet convinced, but <laughs> we're getting heading in that direction. So other, other kind of features of the mathematics are having this as a ratio makes it harder to interpret. If what's on the top is bigger than what's on the bottom, we could think of this as a legitimate government, right? It has more legitimacy than it has non-legitimacy. Are these numbers meant to be like... Do we have any example of what one of these would be? Of course not. <laughs> it's uncomputable. <sighs> All right, yeah, go on. <laughs> a legitimate government looks like an L somewhere in 1 and infinity. Because what's on the top might get as big as you like. There right. is no description of what these look like as actual numbers because he Did doesn't... he tell you that that was the No. The outcomes? How do you know that? Because that's what happens when you get this mathematical form. Illegitimate government is L somewhere in let's go for 
zero, one. Thinking as Ben Shapiro, though, let's say hypothetically you could actually quantify all these and you plugged it all in. Yeah. And America obviously came out as a as like a three, right? But then you put in another nation and they came out as a seven. Yeah. That would make America, to Ben's mind, illegitimate. Because this is fundamentally a statement of supremacy. The whole ideological exercise here is to yeah. try and advertise your own legitimacy. So I'm just saying that as a piece of agitprop, he would very much want to be able to define the range which is legitimate. He wouldn't be happy Except if there doesn't. were positive numbers that he couldn't declare illegitimate. I watched the entire fucking video. <laughs> it was deeply upsetting. And he did not at any point associate any kind of actual figures with this. Okay. Well, he's but he's put letters, which is more advanced mathematics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is this is mostly a look at me. I'm so smart because I talk really fast and have an equation there. Uh, it's also that like William F. Buckley shit, right? Of like trying to like make conservatism look respectable, objective, and, like fucking yeah. smart and shit, right? Well, exactly because okay, I, anytime you start trying to intellectualize and legitimize conservative ideology, you run into the problem that. At the end of the day, it's just about people with a bigger stick telling people with a smaller stick what to do. And so they really hate that they want to intellectualize their position because they have to justify their possession of amenities and resources where other people don't have them. So they have to have an ideology. I'm sniffing, I'm doing this as thing. I don't know if it's showing up on the <laughs> mic. But he has to construct these pseudo-intellectual forms, like you say, like William F. Buckley, to, uh, to prop up the legitimacy of the system. Ironically, this is... A formula to prop up legitimacy, not to determine it. <laughs> I, was, I was just about to say, I don't think anyone on the right gives a shit about that anymore, right? Like, they did for a while, but... Well, that's the thing. <laughs> ben, Ben's behind the times. Yeah, ben, yeah. Has, ben has not got the juice. But Ben fucking hates that any time he goes to talk and to air his intellectual superiority, he runs sm smack fucking dab into that wall of the, the fundamental non-empirical non-mathematical nature of his beliefs because they make him feel good and when people use numbers to show that why it's bad that doesn't feel square good. with him feeling good <laughs> ah yeah so he has to counter it with this and so he and it's also his like his job the reason he gets paid is to come up with this stuff to to massage the exact same insecurities in his audience. But again, with the William F. Buckley example, he didn't like much uh, debating Gore Vidal either. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> they don't. That's why the reason that they love debating kids on college campuses yeah. is because they're fucking morons. <laughs> <laughs> they're in their weight class there. <laughs> so one important thing to notice about these two intervals, right? Zero, one is not the same size in terms of length as one to infinity. Okay, but... It's what so, you do with it. <laughs> I, while I agree 100%, this actually means something for interpretation, right? So if we believe we can get numbers out of this, then a change from a half to a quarter, you have halved the legitimacy of a government. Right. Well, that's the same as going from 12 to 6, because you are looking at it as a ratio. So you're looking at comparative metrics of size in this sort of multiplicative fashion. Yeah. But those don't look the same. I'm guessing that Ben hasn't even thought about this. No, he absolutely his, has not. But in the back of his head, he knows that everyone would be compared to America. Yes, but, I mean, okay, so this is the same as going from four to two. Again, you're you're making very, like, cogent points about <laughs> numeracy here, and I'm pointing out that... Oh, no, no, I, I am, I'm strong man again, <laughs> if you will. I am taking him at his word that this is possible, and I am asking... What does it mean? Uh, Tess, you'll find that in the um, debate pervert circles, that's called steel manning. <laughs> it's not a joke. That's what they call it. Pathetic. This is what I was asking at the start, though. Is like, is it actually designed to be like, it doesn't seem to be done in sincerity or good faith. It just seems to be like. No, it's absolutely not done so that somebody can actually go out and do the research like this. Yeah. Because, not least because you fucking can't. <laughs> we will get to the sorts of questions you can ask in this sort of framework, the sorts of things that are done. Because believe it or not, uh, social science kind of cares about ideas around power and government legitimacy and things. and has for about as long as government legitimacy has existed. I'll agree that this is not serious, but I, I think Ben believes in this because when he looks at this, he thinks this is my attempt to quantify what I know to be true, a.k.a. what makes him feel warm and fuzzy in the gut. Mm. So if you spoke to him about these problems, he'd say you are 
like misinterpreting me. I'm speaking to a good faith attempt to try and put numbers to the legitimacy of a state. And he knows what legitimacy means because when he thinks about it, he doesn't feel stupid. <laughs> and that feeling lines up with his warm, fuzzy feeling about which states are legitimate. So it's got to be true in there somewhere. I disagree. I, th I think he directionally believes in it, but doesn't like believe in the specifics of it. I think it's grist for the content mill, right? Yeah, no. Mm, he probably thinks, oh, this isn't, isn't complete. But I bet somewhere deep down he thinks, if I was a good enough mathematician, I could figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> sure. As a marginally better mathematician than him. No. Now I want to talk a bit more about what happens when you get this structure. So we're going to copy this and go to the next page. One of the reasons that I care about the bottom all being multiplied and the top not all being multiplied is what happens when you get changes in these values. If we look at uh, v times r dash times a dash, right, and we increase v by 1, we get v plus 1 times r dash times a dash, yeah? Yep. Okay. okay. I'm going to expand this out. So we get V times all of this, which gives you V times R dash times A dash. And then you get one times these plus R dash times A dash. Because it's one copy of it. The one just kind of goes away, right? I'll take your word for it. Okay. I'll put in a times one there, right? But it was a plus one. Now it's a times one. Yes, because this bit comes from the V times these. Okay. This bit comes from the one times. Oh, right. Ones. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with yep. you. All right. Now let's do something similar up the top. So we're going to go S plus R times A plus I. I'm going to leave the brackets out. We're going to go to S plus one plus R times A plus I. Well, what we get out here is S plus one plus R times A plus I. We've only got plus one in here that's different. Whereas here on the top one, we have a whole other copy of R dash and A dash. The magnitude of change between these two is very, very different because it multiplies on the bottom and adds on the top. Mm. Liars. It's as long as you're one. <laughs> Layers, I'm going with liars. Mm -hmm. You're just commuting it, really. Shut up. <laughs> All right, to show you what, uh, what happens if we add to the multiplication on the top, we go from S plus R times A plus I to S plus R plus 1 times A plus I. So here we get S again, we get R times A times A, I keep having to remind myself to put the multiplication in, and then we get 1 times A plus I. So here we've gotten another copy of A because I have put the plus one in something that multiplies. The behavior across these variables is not consistent with regards to a change of one unit of whatever. I mean, units? These don't have units attached. What if these numbers are in the like the tens of thousands? What if those numbers are in the tens of thousands? Okay. Th this is one of the things that's so frustrating about this because he hasn't thought far enough ahead to put actual numbers in there. He has mm. no idea what like, it would mean to change it by however much. I'm guessing if you pressed him, each of these numbers would have its own sub-little formula that he would use to derive it. I hope so. <laughs> uh, <for> the <laughs> but I don't know. We don't know what or if he thinks about this sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Rails. That's another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not writing these down, so I hope somebody is. So I can hypothesize that he has the multiplication on the bottom because he thinks that the compression to that zero one one interval and that, like, the multiplication here kind of balance out. So mm -hmm. the, the scale of change on the bottom will be more rapid than the scale of change on the top because you have multiplication. But that, that kind of compression of illegitimacy being between zero one one means that big changes on the bottom... <laughs> the cat wants to be taken outside, so he's joining in. Arrival. So Arrivals. I think that's the longest one. Viral? I'm not writing them down. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. I know you're expanding on like important concepts, but... This has gotten into your brain? This is not the stuff my brain can actually swallow, so I went to play the word Is game. that how you spell <laughs> arrival? Okay. A double R. Ah, oh, there's two I of them. Yeah, yeah, that makes I sense. Oh, um, admittedly, I was going by the, the rules of the 
the New York Times spelling bee where you can reuse the letters. But we do, in fact, have two R's. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to Ben Shapiro. Yeah, exactly. He, he thought ahead to you playing this game, but not to the actual consequences <laughs> of his formula. To bring this back, because I'm the, the dumb guy, I realise this is my sort of role in this exchange. Hey, come over onto my podcast and take my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the extra dumb guy. The fact that he's arranged in this these letters in this way yes means that the scale well i'm just trying to sort of put it into these sort of terms the scale of the numbers on the bottom is fucked compared to the ones on the top because of the way they'll interact yeah so the 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 way that they will change is fucked because like if you go from a value to a value plus one on anything on the bottom that's that's a change of one yeah right that has a much bigger impact on the size of the number on the bottom than if you do that same change of one to the thing on the top. Okay, that's that's true, but you could have explained that easy to a dumb guy <laughs> by saying when you multiply things, they get way bigger than when you add them. <laughs> I'm trying to show why that is. Okay. Yeah. So one other thing to consider, right, is we looked up here about proportional changes, right? So this is halving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what happens if you go from 5 to 5.5? And how does that compare from to going from 0 0.1 to 0 0.6? These are the same magnitude of change as like an absolute number, but proportionally they're quite different. This first one here is a 10% change. The second one, if we take the like scale above zero, is like a 600% change. Okay, to, to steel man Ben's thing here, perhaps if he developed a number at which point a government becomes legitimate he would say that above that point it's all gravy below that point you haven't yet made the grade so even though that change numerically is the same its value is related to how it exceeds or fails to reach his 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 peg as legitimate yeah so this is one of the kind of questions of what is he trying to do here is he trying to actually get a number with all the structure that comes with numbers that represents legitimacy. Is he looking for kind of a binary threshold state where you are illegitimate or legitimate or kind of borderline or whatever? Yes. Or is he looking for an ordering where you can say one government is more or less legitimate than another? Because those are very different things to take from this. As we've discussed, he'd love to have that objective number. So he could say, well, shut up complaining about America because it's legitimate. Its number is bigger than the number you have to be to be legitimate. He would also like to have an ordering so he could say, it's fine if we do X atrocity to Y population because their government is not legitimate or is less legitimate. To him, both 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 are fine. As an ideological object, yes, but this is, this yeah, is yeah. All, so it's you, all good. You can, but they have very, very different behavior with respect to the mathematics. So what I'm really getting at here with this 5 to 5 and a half, 0 0.1 to 6, is that there, there are different structures at play depending on what sort of number structure you have here. If Ben Shapiro is looking at this as a fraction, then it doesn't matter if 1 is the cutoff from illegitimacy to legitimacy or 10 or 100 or something. You still have this question about is it a relationship of proportion that you care about if you can measure quote unquote change? Like, can you say that one thing is twice as legitimate as another? Or is it a, a metric for, like, absolute changes? So is 5 to 5.5 the same amount of change as 0 0.1 to 0 0.6? And this all relies on you able being able to actually assign numbers to this, so it's kind of bullshit. But if you are constructing this as an actual sociological metric or an econometric metric, then these are the things you have to think about. Not that economists universally think about them first, but that's kind of another issue. I mean, it's got to be proportional, right? Like, because the only way that you could kind of derive it is if the only quantities that you could put on those are like a sliding scale, right? On his categories. Yeah. So um, once we've been through some like actual examples of social science research, I'm going to talk about a different formulation of this, which doesn't use a fraction. And so, like, with his fraction, you kind of are locking yourself into a framework that uses proportionality, whereas you don't necessarily have to do that. One of the other potential issues with this is, if any of these numbers on the bottom are zero, this literally becomes infinite. You, you really struggle to get a, a meaningful idea of what he's trying to wrangle here, not least because he doesn't fucking understand what a number is. 
I'd like to add to our list of words varial, which is apparently a skateboarding trick, and aerial as a um, the font. Doesn't count if you fucking check in the dictionary, mate. Come on. What do you mean? I thought of the word. I just wanted to confirm if it was correct. It's a self-marked exercise. <laughs> so are you going to be awarding yourself a prize for this one? I'll have another beer. Okay. Sorry, please continue. <laughs> As I said, this is a genuine question for social science. And social scientists will try to quantify this stuff because you have that kind of intuitive sense that you can have one thing that's more legitimate than another, which yeah. means you have, at the very least, a sense of ordering Mm-hmm. You can also have changes, right? You can have a loss or a gain of legitimacy, which means that there is a movement, even if you don't necessarily have an idea of how big that movement is. Right. We're going to look at some um, examples of the sorts of questions that actually show up in a uh, br- broad social survey that's done that look at government legitimacy. And then we're going to start with a bit of a theoretical framework and see how we would develop that into something that is measurable, potentially, on actual survey data. Is there a, an even slightly agreed upon definition for legitimacy of a government? Um, well, there are a couple, couple of ones that are useful. And I mean, there tends to be like alignment between them along, depending on sort of like the overall ideology of the people, right? So you look at liberalism, as a broad kind of political philosophy, and then you get basically ideas of consent of the governed. So this comes from people like Don Look. But fundamentally, Ben Shapiro's framework here is a liberal one in that context, right? He is yeah. asking, do the people perceive their government as legitimacy? Is Do the people consent to it? His aligns with a whole bunch of other liberal frameworks for this sort of idea of legitimacy. But, I mean, that's quite distinct from... The, the mandate of heaven and divine right to rule of kings and things like that. So there are different frameworks for legitimacy across cultures and time. In the context of like a complete barbarian warlord society, you're very legitimate if you have the biggest axe. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, that is kind of the fascist perspective on legitimacy is, are you the right kind of person, i.e. white, and, uh, and, you know, straight, non-disabled, all the rest of it. And do you have the biggest axe? I mean, there is an argument to be made for what in international relations they would call, like, the realist approach in terms of, like, can your government tell you what to do? That is a form of legitimacy. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's actually functional. So, so the exercise of power is a question of legitimacy. Yes, exactly. And, like, the UN has a, like, what it calls effective governance principles it's the UN, so it's incredible nerd shit, right? But they have three broad categories of effectiveness, which basically means how much can the government implement things? Accountability, so how accountable is the government to the population? How transparent is it? And inclusiveness, so this is your basically, does everybody get lifted when some people get lifted? Is there principles of non-discrimination and participation? These sorts of things are kind of I guess, the hegemonic framework for what uh, we think of as government legitimacy, because it's the fucking UN (laughs) that's coming out with these. But how they, like, their particular framework for this is still kind of governed by that liberal principle of consent of the governed. Other frameworks are a little bit more general, I suppose. So I I think that, like, the one from the UN is very much about what they want to see in, in governments, whereas somebody like Weber was talking about substantive legitimacy which is basically do you share values with your government and i think that that is kind of an important idea particularly in the context of something like a conservative movement or a a liberal movement because people can see their their government as insufficiently conservative because it lets trans people get healthcare or survive and things like that. But they can also see a government as insufficiently liberal, I guess, or, or too conservative. And like we, we look at somewhere like Afghanistan now with the Taliban who came back into power and, and are immediately trying to remove girls from school and women from universities and any like positions of power and things. And the population as a whole is going, well, this really sucks. This is too conservative for us. So that is a form of lost legitimacy because the shared values are not there. I think in the Afghanistan uh, example, you do have to look at it as more like a red state, blue state thing, where you have a rural population that is quite behind all that 
Taliban shit and a city urbanized population that is very much finds it too conservative you know i I, certainly there is some of that right yeah and and you see this across the united states like there are some populations who are very in favor of their their state governments removing access to trans healthcare and things like that and others that are horrified of course even within a given state you know trans people are typically not fans of having their rights taken away absolutely this is one of the things that ben shapiro does not discuss is where does this come from? Where is the variation across people and individuals within a population? Where is the variation across different groups with respect to how they relate to the government in power? Because as it turns... classifications of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> classifications of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Classifications of people. <laughs> yeah. The other half of Weber's kind of framework for this is what he calls instrumental legitimacy, which is, does the government answer to the needs of the population? In some respects, like, Shapiro's ideas kind of come along from that, although he is not willing to talk about values, right? Responsiveness to input and advance to the interests of the population and things like that, those are material things in, in some respects. Whereas, mm-hmm. like, aggressiveness of enforcement, regulatory strictness are about values. His values, which is, you can't tell me what to do, <laughs> because he's a spiritual toddler. So Marxism has a different kind of conception of government legitimacy. It is kind of consent of the governed, but very much from the perspective of the worker who finally gets their hands on the means of production. That is kind of the basis of power within Marxism, which is radically different to something like fascism. Well, also, like, the internationalist model of Marxism does not place so much emphasis on the values of a, of any one particular nation in terms of, like, uh, it depends on the, it depends on your tendency and stuff as well, but it does not see the nation as, like, or does not see the state as a nation, I the, guess. The basic unit of human yeah. organisation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. This is the, the, like, the underlying ideology that underpins this is just assuming that nations in contest with nations is just the the basic state of the universe yeah absolutely one of the things that very like very clearly does not come up in what ben shapiro is doing is any notion of transparency i guess accountability could maybe come up in like responsiveness to input but any transparency or even corruption realistically if i have a shitload of money corruption makes the government very responsive to my input (laughs) You say corruption, but in most, like, bourgeois societies, like, the government is there to enforce the interests of those with money, whether or not they're directly paying in. Yes, so that that is, depending on your perspective, that could be a form of corruption. Yeah, but that's just responsiveness to input. <laughs> so the, the divine right of kings and the mandate of heaven stuff is kind of interesting here, because those were not uncontested, particularly when the nobles started seeing their quality of life go away. You would often have noble houses turning against kings who were not supplying them with sufficient, like, material support. But interestingly, you see from most, like, peasant uprisings, for example, were against the local landlord, but their slogans and stuff would be directed to the king, to, like, petitioning the king, because the king had legitimacy within that. Yeah, so basically, get rid of the local baron. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yes. For us, please, yeah. The existing research that tends to happen within social science is usually built around this framework of consent of the governed. So some idea that a a nation state is granted legitimacy by the people within it. That's not universal. As you said, some Marxist conceptions are different. But if you are going to do research into this sort of thing, you have to think about what you are considering legitimacy to be. And you can take a very kind of um, materialist perspective, shall we say, and say, well, legitimacy, a government is legitimate when it manages to stay in power for long t- for a long time because it is able to exercise power and stay in place. Mm-hmm. Whereas a government is illegitimate if it falls over. So that is n- a radically different perspective to consent on the governed, as mentioned, because like a- a- an incredibly harsh dictatorship that stays in power for a long time could be legitimate by that sort of ranking, Although that doesn't seem to be particularly stable where they have occurred. Well, that's because they haven't done enough I. (laughs) And they haven't done enough S. I would argue that dictatorships often have constituencies, no matter what those constituencies happen to be and however they tend to be organised. There is like this idea that a lot of dictatorships are are wholly disattached from the people, whereas I think in a a lot of like real life situations... 
Dictatorships often have support amongst the people. Oh yeah, absolutely. And often they're they're populist. Yeah, a, for sure. A lot of the time, well, because they uh, they need to do be that. Yeah, well, fascism and socialism are both responses to the the collapse of legitimacy in the capitalist state in many ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in those respects, they they represent people, just radically different people. <laughs> When I went to say this, I thought to myself, hmm, maybe this is out of date. But when I was studying a lot on sort of the, the collapse of Rome, one of the interesting things I read was one author made the argument, and I'm pre-positioning this, maybe this is a shit argument, that one of the reasons that Rome collapsed into the, the empire Caesar type structure is that there was just such malaise at the non-functionality of the state prior to that. So at least among people whose opinion counted the change of state from the quote-unquote democratic model to the imperial imperial one was not exactly... It uh, was not un- illegitimate. It was not illegitimate and it was not unwelcome given the state of play before before that happened. Yeah, well, I look at Britain at the moment and the way that it's... Well, all of its institutions and infrastructure are falling over and I really see that as a ripe environment for someone to come along and basically say, like, we already have a royal structure here. Let's go back to that, but more. Yeah, no, Britain is only saved from um, some fascist or even uh, uh, neo-monarchist push by the fact that, as a people, they are so fucking uncharismatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you can't produce a, a populist leader out of... Um... I don't know. Harry might do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. He's out of there. He's not coming back to check in on the block. We're seeing in the UK that the army is being used, is being wheeled in to, repl- like, basically to strike break, right? Yeah. yeah. But the army is yeah. very poorly treated in the UK as compared to most, like, Western countries. You can see mm. a situation where... The army aligns with the they workers. They stop, yeah, like, uh... <laughs> Well, there's actually interesting I don't think they that. would align with the workers. I think the, the army would just be of the opinion that they just flex their weight to say, we need more... We need. They probably just go for more funding and what. I'm not. I don't think that Britain is going to have some like military coup. No, I don't think so either. I, I, look, this is very kind of outsider like opportunities here, but yeah, it's falling over. Something will break. The legitimacy has gone down because yes, we can go to the theory right in front of us. <laughs> so low social solidarity, <laughs> no responsiveness to input. Nobody can fucking leave because because they've done the Brexit. Yeah. There are, they've moved. I just, che- they, I just checked the map. There's a whole fucking... Ability. I just checked the map. After Brexit, there's a whole fucking channel between them and France. <laughs> They're not advancing the, interest, advancing the interests of the population. And um, yeah, they've got a lot of the, the, the bottom bit. No, they, they have no aggressiveness of enforcement at all because they fired all the police. <laughs> well, okay, but <laughs> that is undercut by the violation of rights which is like their bins not being taken <laughs> uh, i do follow the the milo edwards philosophy that the bins the are, bins yeah. are the fundamental political unit of britain regulatory strictness is low teens are breathing air yeah but that that, that would be good right because a, a small number on the bottom oh i see yeah it means that the the top is heavier weight oh i see yeah mm. Okay, so regulatory strictness in Britain is down be... because they just fucked off from the EU, which had a lot of regulatory strictness. That's true. So maybe they they are becoming more legitimate that way, but the complete collapse of our top row here. I know I'm I'm stretching. I just want to get it to. Work. I just <laughs> want a number. I want a single number. Oh, and we and we love the regulatory strictness from the EU, right? You can't <laughs> subsidize yeah. your national industries. You have to like privatize all your government services if you go into like debt during a recession. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a wonderful yeah, yeah. institution. Mm-hmm. You have to make a small Greek child cry before you're allowed to um, <laughs> import any Russian oil. That's how you you get around that one and kill a lot of like Libyans. Oh, that's just table stakes. I don't think the... I mean, Britain's still on board with that. Yeah. Sure. So we're going to have a look now at some examples of survey questions that get asked. The process of constructing a survey to actually measure this sort of thing is really quite intense because not only do you have to work out, well, what counts as legitimacy, you then have to break that down into individual questions that probe individual aspects of each of those things. Mm-hmm. This sort of... If this top-level formulation worked, each of these like concepts might have a dozen or more things that lead into it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. stuff like to what extent do you believe your interests align with the people who live within 500 meters of you potentially even more narrow than that i mean okay. we're, we're gonna go and have a look now so these questions come from the uh world value survey 
which is a um, repeat, well, the technical terminology, it's a repeated cross-sectional population survey, which means that every period they go out and they take a sample from a population, do the survey on them, collect the results, and then sometime later they go out, but they take another sample. So while you have the same population being measured repeatedly, individuals within that population are not measured more than once. Hmm. Roughly every five years is when these waves, as they are called, go out. And it's been going since the 1980s. Uh, it's expanded massively. There's now about 100 countries involved. It started out with like 10 or 12 or so. It's the World Values Survey. So it's aimed at measuring like values and beliefs over time. How do your values change over time? How, do your how does your perspective on the state change over time? And that sort of thing. Who runs this one? Um, UN by the look, right? Uh, I think it's I think it's UN affiliated. I'm not sure if it's the UN directly, yeah, okay, but they right. probably fund it. Okay. Yeah. So the the ideological framework here is very much the liberal one, right? Looking at consent of the governed and that sort of thing. Though there are like material aspects to that as well. This is not the only survey. There's like a Latin American government. Uh, sorry, there's a Latin American dem democratic values survey i think it's called or something but basically this is a whole bunch of countries in latin america shockingly enough and basically goes around it explicitly asks questions about like how democratic is this do you feel like your needs are met and all this sort of thing so all of these are the sorts of questions that get asked that are potential things to put into a model of government legitimacy. So in here, we've just got a bunch of different questions. This is what we call a Likert scale. So you have agree strongly, agree neither, agree nor disagree, disagree and disagree strongly. Most of the questions in the World Value Survey look either like this or like a yes or no. Uh -huh. Here we also have immediately a, an interesting distinction. So these, these P1 to P6 questions ask about the National Parliament or National Congress which is distinguished from government here. Now, yeah. I believe that these P and G questions are asked in different areas, but there are other questions in the World Value Survey that we'll get to, which separate out parts of government. So like in the US, you have the judiciary, the um, presidential branch, and the uh, parliamentary? Is that a parliamentary? Oh, so you wouldn't be asked both the P's and the G's? I don't think so, no. Because that's very interesting, because... I'd like to know how various different people would define government in the absence of parliament or congress. Well, if you have a king... Yeah, yeah, but I would be thinking about sort of the the, the non-elected bureaucratic officers. Your, yeah, so like judiciaries and things like that. Yeah, yeah, or regulatory bodies or... Yeah, so there are other questions within this that explicitly ask about like local officials and things like that. Or people who run a publicly owned trail train trail sorry those are the letters that you use in the um there's no in t in it ben Shapiro. oh fuck well th the latter ones anyway ale shut up <laughs> <laughs> rail Tra yes, tra train yes it train trail train rail tra <laughs> trail system who who runs your trail system who runs your trail network yeah 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 so uh like things about infrastructure and provision of services mm -hmm. come up but this is because this is such a huge effort it doesn't get into huge amounts of detail with that sort of thing okay yeah so the questions here are like aligned with what we we're talking about in the united nations right so competency and efficiency like how effective is it does it act in its own interests as distinct from the interests of the population uh -huh. there's questions about corruption and transparency and that sort of thing right so these are very explicitly connecting the government to questions of legitimacy and consent of the governed i'm following okay here are some more. So these are more like about individuals within government or with the government overall. So um, these are questions like, are politicians trustworthy? Specifically, these are stated in a very careful way. So that one is, I am unsure whether to believe most politicians, and you can disagree or agree with it. I am usually cautious about trusting politicians, which is not quite the same thing. Yeah. Because I can believe you or not believe you, and still trust you to act in my interests. Mm -hmm. So I would, if I was building these answers into an instrument to measure legitimacy, I would put trusting politicians in a question of, like, reflecting interests. I feel like 
in every country in the world, politicians are not trusted. Like, it's not... Yeah, I mean, like, they, they have a, a reputation for being slimy bastards, Yeah, that doesn't, right? like, necessarily speak to the legitimacy of a particular government if if most people are unsure whether to believe most politicians, because, like... No, no, but this, this feeds into that kind of liberal idea of what government legitimacy means, right? Because, to the liberal mind, if the people in government are not good people then that is illegitimate in some form. I'm interested if Ben saw this, would he think that this is an appropriate way to derive values for his various letters? Does he think that a survey would give you an actual result or would he think that those values had to be derived from something more objective than opinion? Whether or not he had an idea about how to do that, I don't know. I don't know what he would propose as an objective way of measuring this. Because, like, as, as presented... It appears to be something where he thinks that these things can just be pulled out of the ether, right? Well, he's a STEM lord idiot. Yes. He sure. would think that there is some algorithm that could determine each of these and yeah. then plug into his greater ratio determiner. Yeah, but who gets to work out that number? Oh, yeah, he's not... He's not yeah, he's not thinking that far. that far ahead. But for STEM lords and for him, what it probably means is, is I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because Whereas he knows he's, he's smart. And if he doesn't if have you are an actual social scientist, you go... Why the fuck does your number matter more than anyone else's? Yeah, precisely. But my, my question is, did he even consider the idea that a survey, survey tool yeah, could measure it? I don't know. Uh, certainly from a social science perspective, the question becomes, how the fuck else? But like I said, yeah. his answer would be, the computer would do it. Yes. Yeah. And he would have no idea what that would imply. Right. Yeah. A wizard. A wizard did it. Yeah. <laughs> so interestingly, the, one of the ones I want to point out here is politicians usually ignore my community. So mm. this gets at the notion of different groups within a population who have different experiences of governance, which of course is completely absent from Ben Shapiro's conceptualization of this. My community is fairly ambiguous in that, in like a internationally yes. recognized like a uh, survey like that though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I What fucking community? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question to ask. Well, this is, uh, so this, these two here, I believe, come from a, um, a, a section that was specifically directed at areas in the Middle East as like a trial run. Yeah. Right. So community has a little bit more of a distinct meaning when you live in a village and have lived there for 30 generations. Yeah. As opposed to my version, politicians usually ignore the people in my most trafficked Discord group. Yes. <laughs> But also, like, I don't know, if I'm a share guy in a major majority Sunni area, I might have lived there for 30 yeah. generations, but I might see my community as not necessarily the same as... Yeah, yeah. Part of the questions that come into this are demographic information about the respondent. Yeah. So they have the opportunity, I believe, to identify some of this structure. I'm just trying to tie these questions back. If Ben were to consent to allowing <laughs> random plebs to touch his <laughs> precious letters... The bottom section here looks like it's the first R, responsiveness to input. I'm, so, okay, trying, so I'm these, trying to help are, him out here. Yeah, yeah, so these are split up because one was on the, on the second page. So don't look at that that line. There's anything meaningful. But the, Okay, but generally the top is talking about sort of attitudes towards individuals. Mm. Whereas the individual is sort of a material question about like what are the actual outcomes they produce. I don't know. What is the right thing? Well, I don't know. I'm just trying yeah. to see if there's there... You, could you plug this result into a... Well, so what you would typically do with this sort of thing, how you would actually construct a metric of legitimacy using data like this, is you'd basically go through and pick the questions that align with each of the terms. They may not be written in order in the actual survey, but you would pick out the ones that you say, yes, this is about, like, responsiveness to interests, this is about regulatory strictness. You would go through and you would do that. I am not going to do it. No. But... Neither am I. It would be interesting to actually try and produce a number for a given country for each of Ben's stupid little fucking letters <laughs> <laughs> using this data. Yeah, yeah, you could do it. That's one of the things that pissed me off so much, right? Is that he's like, he's so proud of the fact that he didn't look any books for this. I didn't is look this, at any existing research. Again, relatable. This is card 28. I'm like, I'm not going to work. I'm not working for another 14, two weeks. I could potentially, there's 28 cards. I don't know if I give enough of a fuck. <laughs> I'll, send, I'll send you the survey so you can have a look. Do we have results? Oh, yeah. Freely available online. Oh, no. I might have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I could help you with the data analysis. Uh, all right. Yeah. Let's have a look. This is another one. So this is, uh, this is from the actual main Ooh. survey. Yeah. So this is looking at 
organizations within the country, organizations across countries. So you'll notice that you've got the UN, IMF, ICC, and things like that down here. NATO's here, which is an interesting one as well. <laughs> mm. A lot of fours down the bottom there for me. <laughs> do, you, do you have confidence in the International Monetary Fund? No. <laughs> also, what, what does confidence mean here? Because confidence could mean you expect them to act in alignment with your values and interests. I suppose that's true. I do have a lot of comf confidence in the International Monetary Fund that they will be cunts. I'm well, very confident in that. Well, I am confident that the International Monetary Fund and NATO are going to act in my physical interests living in Australia. Right. Because realistically, they will. We're not, we're not a part of NATO, but so that may be not so much. But like these imperial structures, international kind of imperial structures work to my benefit as a wealthy person living in Australia. NATO is an interesting one, though, because they didn't start doing military operations until, like, after the Soviet Union had fallen, when their entire existence had been predicated on the Soviet Union yeah. existing. But hang on, hang on. Are you suggesting to me that NATO, that NATO might have aims and ideological influence unrelated to the containment of the Soviet Union. Of course. But what I am saying... <laughs> really, really? Are you... No. <laughs> what, come on now. What I am well, saying well, is that when the, Soviet, uh, when the Soviet Union fell, until that, until that point, NATO had like hundreds of thousands of troops like stationed across like Eastern Europe, essentially. Yeah. Which were completely pointless because if you went to war with the Soviet Union, it would go to nukes immediately and like... Yeah, but that was basically a jobs program. Yeah, that's why I'm like, how can you like, okay, do I trust them to like, I don't know, keep employing... Yeah, well, this is one of the, this is one of the struggles with a survey instrument like this, right? Is that what it means to be confident in an institution is kind of difficult to decide. Hmm. And it's not necessarily clear. One of the difficulties in writing these sorts of instruments, because it's such a huge investment of time and resources to run these, is how do you get as much as you can from what is realistically a very limited amount of information per person? Huh. Yeah. Listener, send in your answers <laughs> to this sheet. We'll plug them into Ben's algorithm and see what pops up. <laughs> but we can see here also that we have separation between the government and parliament. Or the government and political parties and civil service and this sort of thing. Yeah. There, there is a recognition of different structures here. Of course, whether or not your country has elections. Mm. I mean, as far as I know, like Saudi Arabia and UAE don't. I don't know if they're actually part of this, though. So, you know. So here is an interesting whole section that is completely absent from any of Ben Shapiro's conception, which is about corruption. Yeah. So, like, they have things like this 10-point scale from there is no corruption in my country to there is abundant corruption in my country to, like, where is the corruption? How could you be expected to pay bribes to local officials and things? Yeah, it's very interesting to me, Q114 there, actually entertaining the idea of corruption among business executives, <laughs> which is a serious yeah. division in the political theory of a lot of people because if your country is a liberal capitalist one then the corruption of business is just business yeah well i think to let's say to an american democrat right right what does corruption of business executives look like it doesn't mean that they take bribes it means that they make the bribes right oh so they're engaged in government corruption whereas i would say that the structure of a company with a ceo or some extractive mechanism for shareholders is fundamentally corrupt. Yes. <laughs> as it's because know, the structure, its workers. Yeah, well, right. because the structure of capital is, right? Yeah. I also noticed that civil service providers here lumps the police in with doctors and teachers. <laughs> and um, as, as a teacher, fuck the cops. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, I don't think anybody on that list wants to be in the same list as the police. I, I do also find it interesting that they have that they believe the police provide a civil service and don't count as a local authority or a state authority. I, I would vastly disagree with this formulation of civil service providers, for example. So here is another question relating to corruption, which is basically, uh, what is the risk of being held accountable for bribery? To Ben, this is just... Um, this is regulatory strictness. Well, it could be regulatory strictness on one hand, but also responsiveness to input. Mm. What is, what is corruption if not... Responsiveness to input. Precisely. Well, yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where, like, the idea of what makes a government legitimate 
greatly depends on the resources available to you. I mean, I am sure that somebody with a lot of money who can just bribe their way to whatever considers the government that enables this to be very legitimate because it's reflecting their interests. This is why I'm pro old school corruption, because like, it's much more like dispersed. <laughs> <laughs> The modern corruption is like we got rid of the actual like corrupt dudes who would actually get your shit fixed but you'd have to like kick up money to them yeah and replace it with just like the naked fucking yeah the naked uh, buying of the mechanisms of state buying yeah of the mechanisms of state yeah okay so here we're getting to some other stuff which is basically about your material conditions I, in some frameworks of what government government legitimacy looks like this would be framed under security as in your material security but it, there are other ones which would differentiate between like your material security and your like security with regards to things like experiencing crime and violence. These are very much, are your material conditions okay? And that correlates quite strongly with questions about legitimacy of government because your needs are not being met. Those are my notes. Where are you going? Going back to the equation. Okay, the second page. So this would be uh, I. Yeah, this would be I. The ability of government to advance the interests of the population. Yes. Gotcha. So we've had the questions about corruption. When do we get the questions about mind break? <laughs> <laughs> so here we get to like questions about security, security that relate to like violence and things like that. One thing that I haven't mentioned so far that does come up in ideas of state legitimacy is what we would call the monopoly on violence. Is the state able to prevent other actors from causing violence? which is kind of how it controls the distribution of violence, and does the state use violence itself in what forms? I'm very, I find this interesting because, again, I'm going back, listen, I'm going back through the notes you can hear. <laughs> it's the second page. The aggressiveness of enforcement. This, like I said, to me this seems odd because Ben seems to voice a great deal of favour for the aggressiveness of enforcement whenever there's a cultural war issue about police persecution of minorities. He always comes up with a way to say this was justified, the, the, and, but he, what he doesn't say is that it wasn't aggressive. He'll often say that this was it was proportional to the situation that it was found in. I'm interested that he doesn't have a metric like this. Are you secure? Yeah. I guess social solidarity is where this would factor in. No. Well, social solidarity is about you and the person next to you. Yeah, but are you are you at each other's throats with a gun? Do you if if social solidarity is low, you'd be more you would feel less secure. Yes, but that's very i guess it's related but it's very one-dimensional i'm just yeah the reason i'm on this is because if you've watched any of ben's content which i have not aside from this and by god i will not be watching <laughs> it but uh i i um have the tag mind break and corruption so i have watched a lot of ben's stuff and he's continually obsessed with the right of police to use violence violence and just shocking amounts of it yeah so this would be an objective person and he's Deeply concerned with the security of society vis-a-vis -vis sort of the right of wealthy people to never have to look at a, uh, an unhoused person. So it's very interesting to me that his little arcane formulation here doesn't factor this in as a like an explicit metric. I can't imagine that he wouldn't. So I'm trying to work out where his mind has slotted this in as being factored into the legitimacy. Okay, so I, I have a I have a hypothesis here, right? Ben's conception here of legitimacy is about negative freedom. It's about you can't tell me what to do. Right. The you know the unhoused people being shuffled away from the rich parts of town are not related to you can't tell me what to do, which is what he conceives of as regulation and like aggressiveness of enforcement. It's very interesting if he sees the the literal physical relations, especially in a country like America where the the dialogue is so fueled by the prevalence of weapons, that he doesn't see that as related to legitimacy. That would be very interesting to me. Because he's the kind of neurotic little turd who I think would definitely say a government is legitimate if it keeps me safe and the people I don't like unsafe. Well, the violation of rights also comes in there, right? So if 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 the police were, for example, to bash Ben Shapiro's door in and sit on him until he chokes to death, that would be a violation of his rights. But And funny. And very funny. If they're the right people as well, he'll, he'll get behind, like, private actors, like, He'll get behind Carl Rittenhouse or whoever the fuck, like... Yes. Yeah, yeah. What is hidden in Ben's entire conception here is who counts. Who right. counts towards the legitimacy of a government. And to him, it's people like him because he's a fascist, but without the dedication. Right, yeah, he's, he's um, he hasn't got a lot of skin in the game. I do think it's a very interesting talking point that he hasn't explicitly highlighted 
Yeah, yeah. The the security of the populace, even the security of who he considers worthy as the populace, he hasn't codified this in here explicitly, which I think is, um, frankly, it seems like an oversight. From yeah, so I his... feel like that it, it is certainly an interesting thing for him to have not included. On a, on a slightly different tact, looking at these, how frequent do the, the following things occur in your neighbourhood, I feel like alcohol yeah. consumption in the streets and police or military interfere with people's private life are contradictory. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like police or military stopping someone drinking alcohol in the streets is like interfering with their private life. Well, these are not entirely mutually exclusive, <laughs> but I believe that in that context, they are talking about like, again, this is the weakness of this particular instrument, right? So the police stopping a homeless person from drinking and hauling them off to bait, beat them up or whatever is an interference with their private life, but it's not done in what the liberal state, what the liberal system perceives as a private space. Well, didn't you say that these particular questions are for an example that was asked in mm. a Middle Eastern country? No, no, these, uh, the ones with Q and number are asked for everyone. Right, okay. Yeah. Because depending on where you live, alcohol consumption in the streets is not just a an instance of disorder. It is illegal, yeah. It is illegal and potentially in violation of cultural community doctrine. Yes. I guess, so I, I suppose this is why you have to pick specific questions to generate specific Well, this doctrine. is also why... Well, I mean, in that, in that context, right, alcohol consumption in the streets is perceived as a social threat. Unless... Those people are absolute fucking legends. <laughs> okay, but that is within this framework that may or may not be seen as a negative thing. They're just asking how often it happens. Yeah, yeah. The interpretation of that... That's what I'm saying. You can it's... filter to the particular country and culture. That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. You have to sort of consider the context. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that comes up when you are dealing with this sort of data is how specific do you have to be about interpretate, interpreting the outcomes. Yeah. I get you. These are more questions about monopoly of violence and physical security stuff. So this one down here, like a war involving my country, a terrorist attack and a civil war, uh, it's going to be very interesting to look at the results of those from the next wave out of the US. Because I'm willing to bet that uh, they don't consider what America is currently doing in like Iraq to be a war involving my country. I mean, maybe they do. Like, Some of them will, yeah. but an awful lot of people won't because it's not on home soil. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the right is also, it's getting a bit more isolationist as the old word was. Like, it's, yes. it's getting a bit less interested in. I don't know about that. Iraq, like, just look at the, the ship with this, the fucking weather balloon. Oh, no, no, no. They don't like China for sure, but, but for those they, like foreign occupations. They want occupation. an aggressive posture with China. I don't think they necessarily want a war, but the average person might start worrying about it, which is what they'd want. Yeah, well, yeah. This, is, this is what this question is getting at, right? Right. It's not so much asking, is the government likely to do it? It's what is the perception of the person in front of you? Mm -hmm. I think that like neocon thing of like you go and occupy a country so that you can introduce like liberal values or whatever. I think that's like <laughs> yes. way out of fashion at this point. Like, yeah, not to Ben though. Ben, I think would still like I said, he's behind the times. I think Ben would be still be on that notion, but he, uh, yeah, would not be in, in line with a lot of the population. There. Yeah. Mm. Here, I think the next couple of examples are explicitly looking at democratic systems. Now, because this comes out of the UN, their conception of what democratic looks like means elections, basically. They do have some questions about the things like involvement in trade unions and ability to go to protests and things like that. So other, I guess, non-electoral systems of political action. But most of their um, framework for what democracy looks like is do your elections work for whatever work means it's like how uh, important the right to organize labor used to be in the un charter of human rights and then when the soviet union collapsed it was no longer so important <laughs> yeah so that's the sorts of questions that you get out of a survey like this right they think this is actually the last set of them we have so how you actually bring data like this into a conception of legitimacy or something like that if you want to quantify it is as i said you pick out the questions that you think are associated with a particular concept you do what we call a recoding so you take the question answer and you say does this contribute positively or negatively to the thing so like well if i have a metric of d of democratic involvement this question here of rich people by elections a, a response of very often to that 
has kind of the opposite effect on electoral legitimacy to votes are counted fairly. So you do actually have to go through when you're processing this and recode the answers to align with the sort of information you're trying to get out. Because if you just use the raw numbers, it doesn't work. So I think that we talk about this specifically is that Ben's little formula doesn't make any distinction between an objective idea of legitimacy and the notion of perceived legitimacy, which is why I don't think he would give a shit about like um, survey results. Well, my, my, guess, my question would be, is there really a way to distinguish them? Because you can't really measure this stuff objectively. Again, I'm speaking to sort of Ben's perspective here, mm. because if you listen to when he talks about the complaints of minorities, like when going over statements by Black Lives Matter or other groups who are speaking about you know, social injustice, his first argument is to undermine these people's perspective, mm. the right of these people to express an opinion. He very much has a consciousness or at least some instinctive ability to speak to what is legitimate and what is perceived as legitimate. And I think that part of the reason he puts together this little formula is an attempt to take the perception out of it, yeah. to take some objective measure. Of course, the social scientist says... Fuck you, <laughs> you little goblin. That doesn't happen. It's not possible. I wish to retract my statement. I used goblin to refer to Ben's tiny height and general uh, horrible demeanor. <laughs> not the fact that he is Jewish. Fucking JK I, rolling over <laughs> here. Coming on. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's Cobalt, not what I'm getting at. Perhaps? Pardon? Cobalt? No, I like Cobalt. <laughs> Fair enough. Gremlin? Uh, unless that is another slur I'm not aware of. <laughs> I like gremlins, and I especially like gremlins too. <laughs> All right, then ben, ben doesn't get to be a gremlin. What, something insulting, but not in a slur basis. <laughs> hmm. he's, what, he's that. I'm insulting his individual character. Yeah, he's fuck a, it. He's a Ben Shapiro. <laughs> All right, well, I, I, Tess, I would never call anyone. <laughs> We're going to kind of go through an alternate possible construction, and I'm going to start, because I'm that kind of person, with the mathematics. Which means my first question is, what are we trying to quantify, right? So the notion that some governments are more or less legitimate is part of that quantification. The first property of the numbers is that I have an ordering, or whatever I'm doing. It's going to have an ordering in there. We also have a notion of loss or gain of legitimacy over time. So we can have a change in value. Where's that? In, is this in the formula, or are you...? This is how we go to build a formula. Okay. Because this is, this is what you actually start with if you're doing this properly. Okay. Can I do hear Ben's response to this? <laughs> if he features this podcast and his show, mwah, money, baby. Ben Shapiro, come happen. on the podcast. <laughs> ben, you have right of reply. You can come on the podcast. Exactly, exactly. No, no, he's not coming on my podcast, but he's got his own show. You know, he can reply on his show. But... Uh... I'd love to have Ben on the podcast. <laughs> you can have Ben on your own podcast. I want to I wanna ask him some of these questions, genuinely. I want to hash this out. <laughs> you, do you really want to start a debate law podcast where Ben Shapiro comes on to tap? I don't want to have a debate law podcast. I want to smoke weed with Ben Shapiro <laughs> and get to the bottom Great. of these 34 questions. 34 episodes and now we're fucking cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? I don't want to smoke weed with him. I, I'll uh, I'll step out there because then I I'm silent in the room and he's just like fucking blabbering for hours. That that doesn't seem like much fun. <laughs> I right, look. I'm I'm just saying that um, <laughs> there's a. I think there would be an interesting appeal in seeing what happens to Ben Shapiro's brain under the effects of marijuana. There's that there's that old like stoner thing where it's like, oh, if all the politicians in the world smoked weed. It, there'd be no more wars. It's like, nah, they just like are just as obnoxious as they were before. That's I, true. I know a guy who is one of the most like unfortunate pseudo objectivist STEM lords, who's also a PhD mathematician. Yeah, he's one of my examples of the fact that you can still be a fucking idiot with a maths PhD. <laughs> anyway, the, one of the reasons that he wound up like this is that he spent an awful lot of time during his undergrad high as shit on weed listening to a libertarian. I think the advantage of getting Ben Shapiro high would not be that it would cause him to have some spiritual revelation, but that it might take him out of the guarded position where everything must be approached rhetorically. This is not a bit... <laughs> I think that if you can get a debate lord to do... It's very difficult to kind of order your thoughts defensively, or at all, when you're fucking stoned. <laughs> I think that that's how you would get, like, the actual unguarded response out of somebody, as opposed to, well, consider, you know, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. I'm not going to do the voice. Another question that I care about is, is the difference measurable, right? In a sense of, 
can I say that something has gone from one to two, from four to five? Can I make meaning of that distance in a way that is relevant? I don't think so. So I would say it's not measurable. Oh, so we're done here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can still use numbers to represent ordering. You just don't get everything out of them that you would from numbers. Okay. The interpretation changes, but you can still use numbers to represent this stuff. And, like, alongside this comes the fact that you can't say that one government is twice as legitimate as another. Hmm. So that that just doesn't work, because we have no conception of scale, really. We can say more or less, but not that sort of relationship. Okay. Basically, what we have here is that the only thing that we can get out of the structure of numbers is ordering. Yeah. So we can still use a number to represent it, but that's all that we can take as interpretation. And this is something that people like Ben Shapiro really struggle with, because they think that as soon as you use a number to represent something, it behaves like a number, and it does not. I would go back to the same thing that, provided the results look like what he wanted to see, he'd be perfectly happy with an ordering provided the right uh, People come entries out on top. were on the top and not on the bottom. Yeah, I think that what he fundamentally wants is an ordering, but I don't think he knows that. I also think, like, maybe the most important point is ethno-nationalism within a, eth- within a, like, ethnically diverse state. Yugoslavia in the 90s or lots of, like, civil wars in Africa. Like, Shapiro doesn't give a shit about that. Like, that's his, like, claim. That's why he's talking out loud is because he wants those like things in public but in terms of like right, what, what, what a, how a what state ben is going to hold is fundamentally is... the same sort of shit the Taliban wants yeah. <laughs> there's no uh, note in here for like uh, to what extent you are a theocracy theocracies I think would be entirely legitimate to him because they don't violate any of you use fucking SRAs or I's <laughs> well, I don't think I don't know if they'd necessarily be responsive to input and they may be very aggressive in their enforcement. I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't think that Ben Shapiro would look back at history as a Jewish person and think that theocracies are necessarily great. I don't think he conceptualizes it that far. I don't know. I think he likes Israel. Intelli- I don't think he thinks of it as intelligent. But as Bart said, in a modern context, he'd be perfectly happy to have a state which is... Theocratic. Theocratic. Mm. He'd consider that quite legitimate. We, we've worked out what we can get out of using numbers to represent this, right? We can't use measurement, we can't look at scale, we do have ordering, and we do have notions of change over time. I want to add a further aspect to this, which is the idea of a valence. So what I mean by valence is that you have an idea of a negative value, which is an illegitimate state. What does VE mean here? Value. Okay. Oh, so that dash is a, is a negative sign, not yep. just a notation. Yeah, yeah, and then we have a positive value, which is a legitimate. A criticism of um, Tess of the podcast, Statistically Insignificant, you've used the same symbol for a dot point as you have for uh, a minus sign? I, I, I know that doubling up on my dictation is bad, so how about I put dash a dash just to upset you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I can't say that helps. Then you would have, like, stuff close to zero is kind of borderline. This is This is not a bit. Is that dash... A, a minus sign, or is that actually a? That's a that's a dot point. See, it's in it's in the column with these. Okay, I I'm I'm not joking. I, you know, I, it's, no, it's I, a fair I couldn't question. work it out. No, no. Zero doesn't have a positive or negative value, so. Uh, you can put a plus sign in front of it, yeah. No computer scientists email me about this because I know that's not how it works in a fucking computer. <laughs> <laughs> so we have I we have ordering and we have valence. So that means to me that the best kind of quote-unquote number system to look at, what values can L take? Well, L can be some number between negative infinity and infinity, right? It can be negative, it can be positive. We have an idea of change, so you can move from one to the other or within a like positive or negative range. But the actual size of the number doesn't really matter. Right. You've actually educated me. Oh I've just God. had a thing where your brain realizes something all at once. Revelation? Uh, a thought, <laughs> which is that let's assume that Ben uh, actually plugs in numbers and he actually gets out an order and it's roughly puts the people he wants at the top and the people he doesn't want at the bottom. Because the only meaningful statement is relative, he still has to come along and set the peg for legitimacy somewhere in that order to determine who is legitimate and who is not, which means that this is just abstracting away from his own gut feeling about 
wear that pig sits regardless. Yeah. I've also just had a revelation. I've just seen the Virgin Mary and been told that I have to like drop out and find God. <laughs> Until now, it hadn't clicked for me what is actually relevant about the inability to measure it. Yeah. Versus the ordering. Yeah. Because like I said, to Ben, that wouldn't be a problem. But it just occurred to me that why that number structure is useless, because it's just putting an intellectual hand wave, this fart of nonsense between the fact that he wants to be the person who gets to decide where legitimacy starts and stops. Yeah, well, I am not entirely convinced you would structure it like this and then do the research and then work out if this zero happens. Right. If you have a boundary between what is legitimate and illegitimate. Because I don't think it is a boundary thing, right? I think that there are so many dimensions to this that you can have something that is illegitimate in some ways and legitimate in other ways, and you don't get a fully ordered system. Right. But because we have a single number from Ben's framework, I'm just kind of sticking with that, I think it's much more complex with this in reality. But if you are trying to come up with a number that represents government legitimacy, you don't have that dimensionality. Yeah, but and the, the reason I think that my observation is relevant is that so much of what Ben does is provide a intellectualized barrier between white supremacy, class prejudice, all these other conservative ideological features which nakedly are not acceptable. Mm. Ben's role is to put a structure between those ideas and the conversation so that they can remain assumed but not discussed. When conservatives say that black people get persecuted more by police because of their culture, mm. which is just, you ask, well, what, why is their culture this supposedly... More criminal. More criminal as opposed to white people. It's just, you're just moving the racism back a step. Yeah. And I think that I now sort of understand how... Ben has put this little formula together in his brain. It is a way to square his the contradiction between his conviction that some states are legitimate and some aren't, mm. but the social unacceptability of the desire to pronounce that. Mm. Which, because he's he's so online, he knows that when people go ahead and declare this sort of shit, they get made fun of, <laughs> and he doesn't like that doesn't expressions mean- of these conservative ideas get shot down by any half intelligent person thinking so he's got to put this in between this is where i disagree i i I think he likes being made fun of online i just don't think he likes being banned (laughs) (laughs) i I genuinely think it bothers him that he gets dismissed by these academic arguments and frameworks and he longs to be able to because he's a fucking debate lord he's a little fucking twerp he longs to be able to have this kind of arsenal in his back pocket. He wants his own legitimacy to be justified by having good ideas that are objectively proved. From a, like the mathematical side, which I will forget in half an hour, don't worry guys. <laughs> That's good. That's what the alcohol's for. It's very interesting that he's either so dumb at maths or sort of knows what he's doing with it that he'll use plus signs and and multiplication signs differently depending on which side of the line it is like um i think that he has an intuition for how fraction and multiplication work yeah i think you can get that by doing a shitload of of like fractions and multiplications and addition like as dean said right multiplication gets bigger faster than addition yeah you can intuit that even if you don't really understand what's going on yeah that's dean's second law (laughs) (laughs) what's dean's first law Dean's first law was from the um, episode on sortition. Oh, yes. So with this sort of framework, right, we have an L, if you will, that we can we can observe. And how I would then go about measuring it is I would, I would say, okay, so we have big L, which is this idea of overall legitimacy for a government. But what are you actually going to go and ask people about? And I think you could ask people to both rank countries by legitimacy. I mean, you could have two countries that are equally legitimate in their government, and then you can have them put their own government in there as well, and then say which of those are legitimate and which are illegitimate. Oh, right. You can, on a population survey level, work out where this zero should be. It's not going to be the same for everyone. I I know, like, we're not supposed to go right wing, but it would be pretty fun to decide which governments are, like, more legitimate than others. (laughs) That seems like a fun project. Well, you don't have to be right wing to say what you think about them. And this is the thing, right? This is when you go out and you ask people, what do you think? What is your perception of legitimacy of these things? So you can go and 
get like a scale of one to five, where five is very legitimate and one is very illegitimate. I think when you're straying into other people's countries, though, like you're not going to get like a accurate read. <laughs> like, well, yeah, yeah. So this is why what I would do is do this and then look more closely what they say about their own government. Yeah. So you skip Ben's little formula entirely. No, you don't. Because this is only one of the things you ask about. Oh, you could do both. You could do both. And then <laughs> okay, you can no look at dose. the relationship between them. Oh, oh, wow. You can make the numbers fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's what an equal sign is. But, like, I, I still think, like, ideological er- enemies of the West are going to come out poorly if you ask the average person, even compared to what they think of their own government, even though that not, might not necessarily, like, wash out in the lived experience of people who live there or whatever like well you ask them too yeah yeah of course yeah. this is why we are talking about perceptions of legitimacy yeah and you can have a perception of the legitimacy of government in another country it just may not relate to what people actually experience on the ground yeah so you can compare what people experience about their own government to what other people living in other countries think of their government yeah this is one of the most unarticulable ideological differences between people who accept a, a mainstream narrative on the Israel-Palestine conflict and people who've, who've done some reading, because the Palestinian Authority, the supposedly legitimate government of Palestine, does not have a great deal of, of broad support because of its history as being something set up by Israel. Israel. Yeah. I think that the, the notion of legitimacy internationally versus locally, yeah, I just... That would be quite interesting to take. Yeah, and, and this is stuff you can do when you actually do it properly. So from here, right, this is your one side of the equation. So you're going to have your model is going to look something like L is equal to some combination of other stuff. I'm going to put down some ideas. I imagine you two are going to have some ideas. We'll see what washes out. So my first idea is alignment of social values. So what this means is the government is doing things that I consider moral, and it is not doing things that I consider immoral, and it is broadly supporting things that I consider good for society. So I think that this is genuinely important to, like, legitimacy. And within that, you would ask questions about, like, everything that you could think of that comes al- on under, does the government align with my social values? To me, a government that aligns with my social values is a government that has principles of non-discrimination and, pr- like, actively supports the material conditions of people who are not me. That stuff can come up in this and be asked as individual questions that then combine into an overall value for an individual of the social value alignment. There are questions around waiting and this sort of thing that we are not going to get into today because this is going to be long enough. My second one is support for material conditions. You're just fucking with me now with the dot points. <laughs> <laughs> it's multi-line, so it's going to add all things down here. This is, uh, this is, these are not dot points, this is literally adding things. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. I, I think that this comes in kind of two forms. I mean, the, the questions around physical security and the monopoly of violence, I think, are slightly different, but they are material conditions. So these may not be quite so, like, distinct as I am writing them down here, but in general... Is my life made better by the government? This is what comes under the material conditions here. So to clarify, this slide is what letters would you put in Tess's version of this equation? Yes, but I'm not using letters because then I'd have to go and define them. (laughs) I'm just adding them up. Sure, sure, sure. Because I'm not fucking around with a fraction, so I can just add them up. (laughs) And because each of these are just simply scored on a one to five. Well, they may be more complex than that. But the point is... Yeah, because you you would bring other stuff together to give a value for each of these. Right. Yeah. In your surveys, you'd have values assigned to responses, so you can add, actually just add them the fuck up. Yeah. Okay. So on each in, for each individual, you'd get stuff out of this. Gotcha. The question of weighting is, like, what's the scale of alignment of social values compared to the scale of support for material conditions, right? right. If, right. if alignment of social values is, like, minus 2 to 2, and support for material conditions is minus 10 to 10, right. support for material conditions can have a much bigger impact than alignment of social values. The China conundrum. Mm. <laughs> These are questions about the implementation of this, but broadly, you can just add them up. What, what I'm what I'm sort of getting at with these questions is pointing out the differences in methodology that make this collection of criteria yeah. more valid than Ben's vomit of little symbols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about interactions between these in a second. Right. But I'm actually thinking about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know how this shit works. So the next one is going to be, um, I guess, monopoly on violence. Because, like, people do genuinely experience high rates of crime as a sign of illegitimate government. 
I mean, I personally, I'm not going to add an explicit one here of are the bins being collected. I think that comes under support for material conditions. But, you know. You kind of want to make a distinction between people's experience of actual violence or transgressions legally. Yeah. And their perception of... The current. No, no, no. Of um, stuff that is not criminal, but is nonetheless perceived as antisocial. Annoying. Yeah. I feel like some of that would come under Ben's idea of social solidarity. Sure. But I do have a notion of alienation here. Right, yeah. Because it might not necessarily be criminal for me to go out of my street and see a bunch of garbage on the ground. I see unhoused people. That's not a crack at unhoused people, by the way. It's just yeah, yeah. It's a it... sign that there's some economic condition which is producing unhoused people. Yeah. I see all that, and I haven't seen anything that's criminal but to my mind, I might say this place is going to shit. Yeah. I would also add to that that that's context dependent. If there's a bunch of garbage piled up on the street because there's a binman strike on, then I would probably let that slide, provided that I thought oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the government were negotiating fairly with the union and all that kind of thing. Like We're pointing out that this is instances of disorder is the word I'm yeah. looking for, mm. as opposed to instances of actual illegality. So uh, would you consider like disorder within the monopoly of violence? Well, that's my question. Do you consider that? Well, that is a question. Like one of the re- this is not a final form. These are ideas that I'm throwing out for how you could do this. And I'd much rather a society where there's lots of disorder but less violent crime. Yeah. Well, I guess the question is like, because to, to me, rubbish in the street on a on a con- consistent basis is a material condition thing. Okay. Because no joke, the first line of sanitation in your community is basically is the rubbish being collected? Is yeah, do, yeah. do the sewers work and things like that? So to me, that comes up under material conditions. Something like graffiti is a disorder question. And I mean, to me, seeing a lot of graffiti doesn't bother me. It depends on the defi- graffiti, I guess, because I certainly object to Nazi graffiti, for example. But like a cab scrawled on the side of a building, fuck yeah. And I'd also like. To add to that, like, I'm sure we all have anarchist friends or, in my case, a partner who would object to the idea of a monopoly of violence to begin with, you know? Like, it's not... uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, that is a legitimate argument to be had. Yep, absolutely. To to an anarchist, and, and this is where you look at the relationship between their perspective on the legitimacy of any state and things like this. Yeah. Because an anarchist would say the state attempts to enforce some sort of monopoly on violence and that makes it illegitimate, but also that the state is fundamentally illegitimate. So you could see a, a what I'd call a negative correlation between these two, between L, which is the legitimacy of the state, and the monopoly on violence for an anarchist because they see that as illegitimate. But for a fascist, a monopoly on violence makes the state more legitimate. Absolutely. And I'd also add to that, in the anarchist uh, perspective, uh, the monopoly on violence is why the state is illegitimate in the first place, you know? Like, that is, like, the central feature of the state, and that is why it is objected to. So you can you can look at this, and you can ask questions around, like, political ideology. One of the things I like about this framework, not just because I came up with it, <laughs> like, that I don't like about Shapiro's, is that this is structured in a way where you can ask interesting questions. And Ben Shapiro's is not, because it is not constructed to look at variation across populations. I'm going to add another one here, which is uh, corruption. And then we get uh, transparency. I'm going to add, like, well, we'll use Ben's term of responsiveness. But bound up in this is things like, do you have political agency? Do you have the ability to say, hey, I need this thing that's not being provided, and the state will respond to you? Are you able to make your voice heard? So that's what I consider like responsibility, uh, responsiveness here. That's a good point that you've bound up the provision of resources to the responsiveness to your question. Whereas Ben's version of that is very paternalistic. There's kind of an assumption about what is good for people, what is necessary for the populace. He's not very well defined. He's just said, is the government giving it? With no sort of question about, do the people agree that that's what they're getting? Yeah, well, responsiveness, I, I think... Well, this is something that I'm not writing here. I'm just going to put plus interactions. Hmm. Because I think that you will have an interaction, for example, between support for material conditions and responsiveness. Right. Because if your material conditions are not provided, but you see an avenue where you could have them met, that is a responsive state, but, you know, low material conditions. But what I think is more common 
is that you will see that a support for material conditions is aligned with a high responsiveness. Right. So I'm seeing the shape of your conception here, which is that you have all these various categories about which you ask questions. Yep. And you've said that these things contribute to legitimacy in various ways. We have to kind of work out to the what exact extent they're, framework. Yeah. They're weighted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But have you considered that this isn't as cool as a number that's derived from an algorithm, from a little formula? <laughs> but it is a little formula. Okay, but yours doesn't have a fraction line. Because I know what math is, which inherently makes me uncool, I suppose. I'm making a joke, but genuinely, to a certain kind of person, and to the kind of person who thinks Ben is an intellectual powerhouse, <laughs> this is messy and unprescriptive. Yes, that's the point. But that's what I'm saying. This <laughs> yeah, is yeah. why, like, it would because be so I am actually interested in asking the question. Right. Ben is fundamentally not. I am separating this out, but I want to add a category, which is unwillingness to go to war. Because, like, I know that can okay. kind of fit into alignment of social values, but also I think that states who fight a lot of foreign wars end up quite illegitimate. You have, like, a you have like a veteran population that returns and doesn't necessarily, like, have a, like, often the violence comes back into the metropole, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's not... So I... Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, if you develop one. state mechanisms for persecuting and suppressing a population, weapons get used. If that's in the, the state's toolkit, and then all of a sudden people get uppity and they start asking for, like, a wage increase, Bart's entirely correct. It comes back home. There's a lot here to unpack in that statement, right? So I think that unwillingness to go to war overseas is distinct from unwillingness to defend yourself oh yes no no no. i fully in agreement there i'm not like uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no no I, I figured you would be but let's break this down a bit right let's do the sociologist sitting here trying to work out how the fuck to ask this <laughs> question unwillingness to go to war to me is you do not try to exercise power overseas yeah or, or at least not violent power soft power is kind of a different thing entirely right respect for other nations Thanks. recognition of others of of other sovereignties or something? I'm not necessarily going to write this down, right? But you can you can see how you would separate out... We can look at Ukraine, right? Ukraine was not inclined to invade other places, but has is vigorously defending itself, and that effort at vigorously defending itself is increasing its legitimacy to its local population. Th that is quite distinct and has to be sort of accounted for. And interestingly, what you see there is a loss of the monopoly of violence by the Ukrainian state because somebody's fucking invaded them. Yeah. But I don't think that would lead the state to be seen as less legitimate. Absolutely. So in that case, you would get a, like, this bit uh, would not correlate so much with the legitimacy. So you, so you can see these sorts of things coming apart here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think, like, it uh, explains a lot why Iran won the Iraq war for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that you can do with this, once you've asked these questions, is you can look at variation across the population. That is way more interesting than whatever the fuck Ben Shapiro is trying to do. Because you can ask, why are these populations seeing the government as more or less legitimate? Gee, I wonder how much it would correlate with support for material conditions. That I, I suspect that support for material conditions and alienation, probably responsiveness as well, would become the dominant aspects of this. And I get, I suspect that support for material conditions would probably be the leading source of government legitimacy if you actually go out and measure this sort of thing. For example, I don't give a shit about corruption in general. Like, I think it's obviously when it interferes in the political process, that's fine, but... That's a problem, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think anti-corruption is a political tool and is usually used in... Uh, it's how they got rid of Lula, right? Like, it's like... Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily, like, it's never evenly applied and it's never, never like, applied in any... It's the same when they talk about union corruption. The SDA is the most corrupt union in the country, but the CFMEU gets all the corruption claims because... They go on illegal strikes and they like... It's being used as a cudgel against them, yeah. Well, yeah, so this is the distinction, I guess, between legal corruption, which we might see as like the ability to do make legal donations to political parties or something, as opposed to, I guess, with a union, a, a corruption of purpose. Yeah. So the SDA is corrupted in purpose, even if what it's doing is perfectly legal. Yeah, I'm just saying that on Dean's personal scale... Yeah, corruption is not nearly as important. If, I oh, have sure. got, <laughs> if I'm not alienated, I have a responsive and transparent government that supports my material conditions, I don't care if the guy at the top 
is embezzling. It's usually on a personal scale, whereas on the scale of a state, it's it's petty. It's beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what I think comes up in this is that corruption, high levels of corruption, are not correlated with support for people's material conditions. That's where this comes out, right? Right. So, that's what that's what I'm pointing out. Is the corruption in and of itself? Yeah. It's kind of irrelevant. It's where it affects these other. Yeah. Yes. I always think about corruption in terms of the Soviet Union, right? So, um, for example, the like highest levels of the party would have personal cleaning staff and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But if they lost that job, they would no longer have that staff. In our system, Elon Musk will have like personal cleaning staff forever, no matter how much he fucks up Twitter or Tesla. What if I get my companies. hands on him? He is that str- strata of society. But there is yeah. literally yeah. nothing he can do that means he will not have people cleaning his house, you know? No, I agree. That's I pointed this out earlier, that the corruption of uh, people in positions of wealth in a capital society... Is capitalism. Is, is, <laughs> it's, cor- it's corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that there's a law that says it's not. I have a card that says my um, exploitation of others is not corruption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. Okay. That is actually all of my notes. Marvellous. We're only two and a half hours in. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming on. Oh, I, I should I should uh, plug my Twitter just because. Oh, yeah, go uh, on. So it's at Snitch and Orwell, no G. And if I'm going to plug my Twitter, I might as well plug something I like just because I feel a bit gross plugging stuff and I brought it up. <laughs> so uh, the movie Phase 4, it's a 1970s kind of genre movie. It uh, rules. It's about the ants taking over. Oh, fuck yeah. Free us from this prison. Dean, thank you very much. Uh, You're very welcome. Dear listener, if you are listening to this and you are not on our Patreon, you can get bonus episodes. So go uh, sign up. I think the lowest one is five Australian dollars per month. We don't even make you pay American dollars. And uh, you can help me buy more beer for Dean. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you later.